This is my mum and dad. They were married 57 years ago. They met when they were 14 years old and I was born when they were 19. I think it's fair to say that there were more than a few challenges along the way. My dad was doing his apprenticeship at the time and money was extremely tight. By her own admission, my mum couldn't even boil an egg. So here we have these two young teenage parents with this brand new little baby. As the 60s were swinging all around them, how did they navigate the demands of that tiny little human being that is so dependent on them for all their needs? How did they work out what was being a good parent? How did they help their child? How does anybody help their child grow up to be a healthy, functioning, reasonably contented adult? Well, I'm here, so I survived it. So I presume they got something right. But I'm interested in what they got right and what other parents get right. I'm a psychologist and I work with families. I don't work with happy families. I work with broken families, separated families, families with really messy lives. I work with families where mum or dad or one or more of the children have experienced trauma or they may be distressed or they may be psychologically unwell. So questions about parenting are, are really, really important to me. We moved to Bridgem when I was two years old. Mum and Dad had some shared values, supported each other with those values, quite traditional values at the time. My dad believed his role was to provide for the family and he worked extremely hard. He went to work at daytime and at night he went to night school and he studied. So I don't recall him being around a lot of the time when I was that young. I do recall this one particular birthday. I don't recall exactly whether it was my third or my fifth or my seventh. But what I remember is my dad wasn't there. It really stuck with me. It stuck with me so much that I brought it up in therapy more than 35 years later. It was though from the perspective of that little child that my daddy didn't quite love me enough to bother turning up to my birthday party. We have no concept at that age that we are anything other than the centre of our parents' universe. What could possibly have been more important? He had to earn a living or keep a roof over our heads. Such practicalities just don't enter the heads of little children. When he was around, though, my dad was playful. He was really playful. That proper, boisterous, rough-and-tumble play, which is so important for our all-round healthy development. There was lots of chase and tickling and play-fighting. Sometimes he would wrestle both me and my sister at the same time, and we'd get overexcited, and one of us would invariably get hurt. There were often tears. I recall turning around on more than one occasion and shouting, I hate you, Dad. When I look at my own parenting, my daughter reminded me of an occasion when I lost my temper with her. I was packing for our holidays. Never a good time to be on the wrong side of me. She asked me something and I didn't respond. So she asked me again. I still didn't respond. Eventually, I turned around to her and I said, Will you just get lost? So she did. She walked out the house and she just went. And she was gone for quite a long time. I was worried sick. I texted and I called, but she didn't respond. And Dad drove round in the car trying to find her and no joy. Eventually she came home. She told me recently it was because she was desperate for a pee. She hadn't taken a phone with her, and when we checked, there were 37 missed calls from me. As children get older, it is sometimes they that do the shouting, they that lose their temper. There might be lies or defiance or protest. As they do what they're supposed to do, they rail against the rules and they test the boundaries. 
There was one occasion at the swimming baths with the family when I was about 13 years old. My dad must have said something. He's getting a bit of stick today, my dad. <laughs> he must have said something and I felt it was like a criticism. I always felt I was being criticised. Anything anybody said to me felt like a criticism when I was 13 years old. In a moment of defiance or protest, I gave him a two-fingered salute. I recall sitting in the changing room for what felt like hours later, filled with shame and not wanting to face him. When I did go out and I skulked out to the car park, he just gave me a look, that look of disappointment, and he never, ever said a word. He didn't need to. Now, I know everyone here will have similar stories in their childhood of these negative experiences that they have. They're so memorable for most of us because they're, they're rare. They're not the norm. And we have a bias to remember negative experiences. But when I look at all the wonderful memories I have of my childhood, those negative experiences just pale into insignificance. Tiny infant human beings are born with a brain that attaches to their primary caregiver. Even if that primary caregiver isn't very good at parenting, the quality of that attachment shapes the adult that we eventually become. It shapes our personality, it shapes how we manage our emotions, how we think, how we develop relationships with others. It in turn shapes how we parent our own children. In the 1950s, paediatrician and psychoanalyst Donald Winnicott came up with the concept of a good enough parent. He hypothesised that children need their primary caregivers to mess up just a little bit on a regular basis. When we're tired or irritable or ignore our children or don't apply our rules consistently, that attachment bond is ruptured just a little bit every time. Now this might be because as parents we're tired or we've had a difficult day at work, we might be having relationship difficulties, we might be having a bereavement. We're human, we have bad days, life is complicated. Children learn that their parents mess up, that they're less than perfect, and that's okay. Because from a child's perspective, being a perfect parent can be as harmful as being a neglectful parent. What they need is Winnicott's good enough parent. So we have this child-rearing system which is dependent on working best when there are some failures, the little ruptures to the attachment bonds. But there's also another important component to our child-rearing system. When we mess up, we need to put it right. Not just that we need to put it right, but our child-rearing system expects us to put it right. Psychologists call this reparation. We need to repair those tiny damages to that attachment bond. I have a little equation for this. It helps me remember it. The best outcomes for our children are attuned parenting most of the time, plus occasional ruptures, plus reparation within that context of unconditional love. When I see this equation in place in families, children do okay. They learn to manage their emotions, they turn up, um, develop good relationships, and they grow up into reasonably well-functioning adults. Our child-rearing system works best when both parents work together. They support each other. When there's um, some strain in the system, one of them steps up so the other one, when the other one's having a difficult time. But what happens when our parents separate? What happens when two people no longer love each other and go their own way? What happens to children in these separated families? There are often feelings of hurt and anger, of betrayal and abandonment when two adults separate. In the majority of cases, both parents are able to put their feelings to one side. 
and continue to work to actively support their child's relationship with the other parent. There are difficulties with transitions, a new way of living and a new way of being. But when both parents support the child with love and care to maintain the relationship, those difficulties are usually overcome quite quickly. But what happens if one or both parents aren't able to put their child's needs before their own? If you go back to that case, remember I mentioned when I shouted, I hate you, Dad. Imagine for a minute that my parents had been separated at the time. And I'd been at my dad's and I'd come home and I was clearly a little bit upset and a bit red in the eyes. And my mum asked me, what's the matter? And I turned around and said, I hate dad. He really hurt me when we were play fighting and he didn't stop when I asked him to. What would my mum say to that? Would she say, oh, you know what he's like. I know you were having a wonderful time. You were probably laughing right up until the minute that you started crying. You know daddy didn't mean to hurt you. He loves you. Shall we pop around and give him a hug? But what if my mum had said, oh gosh, your dad's hurt you again. That's, that's terrible. He seems to hurt you an awful lot of the time. I don't think he can really love you if he keeps on hurting you. He used to hurt me too. What, what do you think we should do? I'm a bit worried about you when you're around there. Maybe, maybe, maybe you should stop seeing your dad. What messages would I hear if my mum was to say that to me? My dad's a bully and he hurt my mum. Being with my dad is dangerous. I don't need to sort this out because I can just avoid seeing him. I don't have to spend time with my dad if I don't want to. This is my same dad. His behaviour hasn't changed at all. He loves me just as much as he did before. There's been a rupture in that attachment bond and he needs to put it right. I need him to put it right. But how can that happen if my mum keeps us apart? Or if we look at my daughter, that situation where I told her to get lost. What if I'd been separated from her dad at the time and she'd left my house and gone to his? What if he said, your mum threw you out? She's a bitch. She just doesn't look after you properly. She doesn't love you as much as I do. I really, really worry about you when you're around there. You don't have to put up with this anymore, you know. You really don't have to. You don't have to go around there. You don't have to go on holiday with her. You're 11 years old now. You can decide where you live. You don't ever have to talk to your mum again if you don't want to. I still love my daughter. I messed up. There was a rupture. I need to put it right. My daughter needs me to put it right. One of the most important relationship rules is that when we mess up, we need to put it right. And we need to put it right quickly. We need to say sorry. In the case of those ruptures to the attachment bonds, our children need us to put it right for them. The longer that rupture remains, the longer it festers away, the more difficult it is to repair and the more damage there is for our children. It doesn't just damage our relationship with our children. It damages our child's ability to regulate their emotions, to think critically, to develop good relationships as they go forward. Our children need us to repair those ruptures. The, the families that I work with, I see these patterns of behaviour all the time. They are often unable to put their needs before the needs of their child. They cannot prioritise the need for their child to have a relationship with the other parent. They feed their child with negative messages. They rewrite history again and again. They twist and misinterpret their child's experience. And they keep the child away from the other parent, stopping those ruptures being repaired. 
They do this for weeks, for months, and sometimes for years. They put their child in an intolerable position. And in doing so, they cause their child harm. And they increase their risk of lifelong mental ill health and relationship dysfunction. When you fall out of love with a parent of your child, remember that you used to love them once, that you created this special, unique, wonderful human being out of love. Deal with your hurt, deal with your anger, get the help you need, but please continue to support your child's relationship with the other parent. When you're no longer parent together, Please carry on helping your child to support the repair in those ruptures and carry on being just that good enough parent. Thank you. <laughs>